This conference will now be recorded. All right, how's everyone doing this evening? All right, uh, whoop, there we go, it's already moving on me, but that's, that'll be fine. Uh, so is, uh, uh, is the microphone on? Can you hear me in the back? Okay, good, all right. Uh, so as Steve mentioned, we're uh, at the beginning of training here. This is kind of our spring training for, if you will, for tax season, which is ironic because we just started fall. But uh, wanted to kind of go a couple things, uh, just a reminder of a few of the areas that we get a lot of uh, concerns, questions about during the uh, tax season itself. So one of the series of uh, programs we have to uh, help augment uh, some of the additional training you get throughout the season. So 1099s is an area where we get a number of questions, uh, sometimes unique, uh, unusual items. So we want to try and cover those as best we can in our session tonight. The fortunate part, uh, this is one of the few areas that didn't really change with the new tax code. Uh, a lot of the income areas are pretty much exactly the same, uh, which will be great when you come back for the deductions and uh, uh, dependency part, that'll be much shorter than has been in the past years. But uh, wanted to cover a lot of things about the 1099 tonight and ask, uh, answer any questions you may have uh, concerning the uh, retirement income and how we would treat that. Just as a reminder, uh, what the 1099-R is going to be doing is going to be reporting distributions from certain types of plans. Uh, the predominant ones we're going to uh, see are going to be the individual retirement arrangements, the IRAs. Uh, we may see the uh, simplified employee pension plan, the SEPs, uh, the uh, simple plans as well. All of those are going to be retirement plans basically held by the employee. Uh, we may see pension plans and the difference between a pension and an annuity. Uh, a pension plan is going to be a series of periodic payments made over either time uh, or a lifetime, uh, usually in contemplation of retirement from an employer. An annuity, on the other hand, and we're gonna see some distinctions on what an annuity is, is also a series of payments over time. Uh, these may typically be purchased outside of a traditional employment context, so they may be a little bit different. So we'll see a couple changes of how we'll see some reporting there. Uh, we'll also see some of the other uh, insurance contracts, so you can be purchasing commercialized annuities as well. Uh, what we're gonna hopefully find is uh, to give you some tips and techniques on looking at the 1099-R, determining not only what's taxable for federal purposes, but also carrying that over for state and local as well, because there are a couple uh, unique aspects that may be uh, taxable as well for them. So most of you are hopefully familiar with the 1099-R itself. We do have a couple examples in your packet. Uh, just want to highlight a couple of the areas in there. Uh, traditionally, what we'll see every 1099-R will have uh, an amount in box one. Uh, in most cases, we will see something in box 2A, which will indicate the taxable amount of distribution. Uh, if the third party administrator, the one preparing the 1099-R, knows that it's an entirely taxable distribution, uh, the same amount will be in box 2A as it is in box 1. Uh, if you do get a 1099-R uh, and it does not have anything in 2A, uh, we're going to go through a couple of uh, scenarios of what we should do to determine the taxability amount. But in most cases, it's probably going to be the same amount in box 1. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, indication there is a box 2B, uh, which is actually indicating that the taxable amount is not determined, meaning the third party administrator may not know how much of that distribution would be considered taxable. A lot of that may happen if a, uh, one of your tax clients is actually rolling their account from one provider to another. Uh, kind of a common practice, you may end up leaving your employer, you may decide you wanna change your 401k or your IRA provider, if you roll your funds from one to another, they might not know whether or not you had any non-deductible contributions. So therefore, they're not entirely sure whether the entire distribution would be taxable. So quite often, you may see that box 2B being checked, even though in most cases, the entire amount is going to be considered taxable for federal purposes. So just want to let you know that we may see a lot of the 2Bs, and that's traditionally from people rolling accounts from one provider to another. Uh, we also want to take a look at that context for the 2B uh, for early distributions. Uh, uh, we may see that there's an indication there uh, if we have a, a complete withdrawal of the account. Uh, that's generally meaning that someone has taken all their money out, which is what total withdrawal means. Uh, if they're under 59 and a half, we could be uh, looking at one of the early distributions, which would also indicate we'll have some penalties which we'll talk about some of the coding in just a little bit as well. So we do want to watch those boxes uh, on the two Bs. One would be uh, whether or not we can determine how much is taxable, the other being a total withdrawal. So if you see a total withdrawal, we're going to expect to probably see a couple different codes show up. And uh, maybe someone just decided, I'm tired of taking required minimum distributions out. I'm going to go ahead and take the whole thing. Or I'm going to roll the account from one plan to another. We'll see a, spe a specific code for a rollover. Uh, or that they're terminating early, and we'll see, unfortunately, an early withdrawal indication. Uh, typically, what we'll see in box four will be if there's any federal income tax withheld. 
Uh, one of the areas we do want to just make sure we do include that in all 1099Rs, uh, making sure it's in the tax layer system itself. Uh, we do have people that uh, decide that they would prefer to have withholding out of their retirement account as opposed to trying to go ahead and have any withholding with Social Security or other types of estimated payments. So uh, doesn't happen often, particularly within clients in the VITA system, but every once in a while people will have money withheld from their uh, retirement distribution. So we don't want to overlook that uh, that amount. Uh, box five is kind of a unique box. That's actually going to be showing us uh, how much of the employee's money was recovered tax-free during the year. So this is going to be a unique situation that we're going to be taking a look at. There may be some changes between how much is reportable in box one and how much is taxable in box 2A. Oftentimes, that box five will help you indicate why that amount is different. There may be some uh, portion of the employee's own money coming back to them in, in a uh, tax-free uh, recovery uh, basis. Uh, so we'll talk about that, uh, particularly in context with Pennsylvania as well. So that might be the portion that they're recovering, not subject to tax. Hopefully, the third-party administrator knows to put in box five. They've also corrected box 2A to show the entire amount's not taxable. Uh, the one critical one we want to take a look at is going to be box seven. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about box seven and the various distribution codes. We try to provide a couple examples of 1099R so you can actually see what those are going to look like and how we're going to be able to work with those in practice. Uh, box 9B is going to be an interesting one as well. This is going to be one where we'll probably be uh, looking to see whether or not we can use what's called the simplified method. What not, box 9B is going to show is the total amount that has been invested in an annuity uh, under a qualified plan and after-tax contributions. So effectively, what someone's put into a qualified annuity that would be representing their own investment. So one of the things we take a look at in the tax code, even though the IRS will say everything is taxable unless we tell you otherwise, they do have a provision that your own money won't be taxed a second time. Even though most of our clients don't believe that, they think they're gonna get taxed on everything. Your own money's come back to you tax-free. So what we wanna take a look at is the application of that box 9B in how we can go ahead and allocate that to ensure that the taxpayers aren't paying money on their uh, original contributions. So we'll talk about that and when we get to the simplified method. One of the ones we really don't see much of at all is box 12. And that's going to be any type of state withholding on retirement distributions. Uh, the reason why is because Pennsylvania typically does not tax retirement distributions. Now, there may be a couple exceptions, and we'll talk about a few of the coding issues that might be uh, a little bit different for PA. Uh, in addition, Pennsylvania will also tax early withdrawals from retirement plans. So we're going to consider that part of earned wages. So you may see some circumstances where someone has gone through a process and they talk to their third party administrator. Uh, if they're not from Pennsylvania, they may not be aware that Pennsylvania doesn't tax retirement distributions. So every once in a while, you may see someone has decided to have tax withheld on their uh, uh, distributions for state purposes. If it is, we'll just put it in a tax layer. It's going to come over. PA is probably going to ask for that copy of the 1099R about 12 times before they go ahead and actually accept that there was withholding on it. Uh, but that's the summer work that we get to deal with uh, over at the VITA office and keep Steve busy after April 15 when we deal with those questions from PA. Uh, so those are basically the overviews that we have for the 1099R. Fortunately, the format hasn't changed. Uh, as you can probably tell when you see the 1099Rs, we have required information, but they may not always be in the same place, much like some W-2s that they have required boxes, but they don't always look exactly the same from uh, individual to individual uh, when they come out from the third party administrator. So just a couple of the codes that we're going to see typically uh, and hopefully in VITA would be code one, and that's um, uh, an early distribution. We don't want to see this, but unfortunately we do see it a little bit more often. Uh, it's going to be a uh, early distribution. Typically the uh, uh, taxpayer is under 59 and a half. Uh, when you take money out of your retirement plan early, uh, the government will not only tax it for income tax purposes, but it's also subject to an additional 10% penalty. Uh, this is usually a pretty good opportunity for you to take a look and see, uh, hopefully there's enough withholding. Uh, whenever you see a code one in a 1099R, generally the taxpayer will have a much different result from the prior year. So if they're a returning client, get them ready. The result's going to be different. Uh, if you have a box of tissues, get those handy because you may need to have a different conversation about what to do at the end of the uh, uh, tax return. The early withdrawal process is going to be one in which someone has decided that they're probably uh, in a position where they may be leaving employment. They typically get an option. Would you like to go ahead and keep your retirement dollars with us? Would you like to go ahead and roll them to your new employer or take them out and put them in your own individual retirement account? Or would you like us to send you a check? A lot of people decide I'll take option three. I'd like the check today. 
um, I'll just take the money out of my retirement account. I'm not planning on retiring anytime soon. I can just build those monies back up at some point in the future. Unfortunately, that will be taxable for federal income tax purposes. They may not be aware of that. We usually see them months after the fact that they already went through the process. In fact, they'll come in and say, no one ever told me this was going to be taxable. Well, you're pretty sure that they did. They had a couple pages you had assigned to be well aware this was taxable. They even asked you how much tax would you like withheld. So hopefully we're going to see that people have something in box four to help uh, overcome that uh, early distribution. So not only is it subject to income tax, but it's also subject to a 10% penalty uh, unless an exception exists. And we'll talk about that exception in a little bit. The other downside of the code one is that it also may be taxable for Pennsylvania um, and consequently for local purposes as well. So not only are they gonna get hit for federal, but also Pennsylvania and local. And the downside is they typically do not have any withholding for state or local purposes. So they'll probably have some checks to write come April 15. Uh, now, code two is uh, also, it's an early distribution, but typically there's an exception that applies that the third party administrator is already aware of. Uh, we typically see these in cases, uh, if you may have a client who comes in and, and they're getting a, a retirement distribution uh, due to a divorce situation, uh, and they're under 59 and a half, that's actually an exception to the 10% penalty. The third party administrator already knows that, so that they're gonna put the code two in. Uh, just so your tax layer program won't say they're under 59 and a half, we should apply a penalty with the code two that's going to make sure it's not applied. So you don't actually have to fill out any 59 or 5329s. It's going to take care of that automatically. Uh, we don't often see the code three, but every once in a while it may show up. This is within scope for BIDA. It's just on account of disability. Again, that'll mean the penalty will not apply. It's just going to be taxed as a distribution. Again, it's going to basically make sure the tax program knows that the taxpayer is not of normal retirement age but the distribution will not be subject to the additional penalty. Uh, the fourth one would be on account of death. That would be uh, obviously not the death of the uh, person getting the money, but their beneficiary. So if you inherit a retirement account uh, and you take those distributions over time, that money is not gonna be subject to the additional 10% tax. It will be subject to income tax, but it will not be subject to the 10% early withdrawal penalty. So the first four numbers that we're dealing with are predominantly for people under, not, under 59 and a half, uh, taking money out. Uh, one of those is not a great situation to be in. Unfortunately, it's the one we see most often, but the other three are exceptions to that automatic 10% penalty. Uh, number uh, code seven is the one that we'll see predominantly uh, for retirees. This means that they've reached normal retirement age uh, and they're getting uh, a series of distributions or one-time payment under the uh, traditional uh, retirement payout of their plan. So the code seven means that it's going to be subject to federal income tax uh, generally not going to be subject to Pennsylvania or local income tax as well. Uh, a couple other ones that we'll see, as I mentioned, uh, we may see a code G. That's going to be for a rollover of a plan from one to another. That's sometimes where we'll see it, where you'll see the total distribution box being checked, a code G being in place. Nothing will be taxable. Uh, we do need to report that on the income tax return. The IRS is very, very good at matching numbers, and all the third-party administrators will send a copy of the 1099R information to the government. So at the end of the year, they'll make sure that you reported all those amounts on your return. And if they don't see it, they're going to assume that it's taxable. And that's not a good letter for the client to get. Usually the IRS doesn't ask them politely for clarification. It's usually a letter that's very confusing that says, if you agree, just send us a check for $25,000 and we'll leave you alone. You may keep your firstborn child. You know, we won't come ask any more questions. So um, if you do get a 1099-R, uh, you want to go ahead and enter that information. Uh, a couple of the other ones are going to be for Roth accounts. They're going to be for a direct rollover of a Roth. That's similar to a code G. That's just uh, for a Roth uh, account itself. Uh, we could have a qualified distribution from a Roth. That'd be a code T. Uh, or you could have a code T, which is a Roth IRA distribution, um, but an exception does apply. So we're not going to be penalized on the Roth distribution that there's some other uh, exception that applies. These are the codes that are, uh, as of today, within scope for VITA. So if you get a 1099R that has a different code on it, uh, we want to go ahead and take a look at that, uh, make sure that the return is still within scope and if there's an area that we can address. Uh, the one thing I do want to mention, sometimes you'll get a series of 1099Rs and it may look like they're multiple copies. I think you're all pretty familiar with getting W-2s and you may get someone who brings in multiple copies of W-2s. Every once in a while, someone will bring in 1099Rs and initially they all look like they're the same one. You may want to double check. Every once in a while, if someone's taking, say, $10,000 out of each of their Vanguard accounts, they'll get a separate 1099-R from each of those accounts. 
So you may just want to double check account numbers, make sure that the amounts are exactly the same. If they are exactly the same, then it's probably a duplicate 1099R. If they're slightly off, it means they're unique 1099Rs, and we should probably go ahead and include those. So just a little bit of a warning when we go through that process. Every once in a while, you may get one, and uh, custom to people dropping a whole lot of things off, and oftentimes when you ask them, they're not entirely sure how many accounts they have or where the money came from or maybe where it went. Uh, but you do want to just ask. Uh, make sure you have the accounts. Do you have three accounts with this uh, Fidelity? Do you have uh, two withdrawals that you've taken out last year? Um, and we can get some clarification uh, on those. But we just want to be sure we're reporting all the uh, 1099R information that we get from the client on the return. So just a couple other things. Uh, when we take a look at the uh, 1099R as well, there'll be a box to indicate whether that is a distribution from a IRA, SEP or simple. The only thing that's really going to do is help determine where that amount is going to be reflected on the 1040 itself. Um, so traditionally where we've seen these show up um, has been on, and we'll have to update this for the new, uh, new form here, uh, it won't be on line 15B anymore is line 15B doesn't exist, it's been modified. But it's just gonna be indicating where that will be showing up on the uh, 1040 itself, just an indication whether it's coming from an IRA, separate or simple, or whether it's become from a uh, pension or annuity plan, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. When we talk about kind of that traditional IRA, separate or simple, in most cases, everything that they're gonna be taking out of the plan will be subject to income tax. So even if box one has an amount in it and box 2A is blank, Tax layers are going to assume it's entirely taxable. That's our general presumption as well, that unless we have evidence to the contrary, anything that's going to be a distribution coming out of an IRA, SEP or simple, is going to be fully taxable to the recipient. And that's pretty much how we'll go through. We will ask a couple questions as we go through, and I'll kind of mention those as, uh, as we go along. But in most cases, whatever is the gross distribution will always be the taxable distribution with a few limited exceptions. And we'll talk about some of those, and most of those are going to be coming out of the pension and annuities. Uh, same thing with the Roth IRA. Traditionally, what we're going to get if someone has a Roth account, uh, and depending uh, maybe which location you're in, we don't typically see a lot of Roth distributions yet, a lot more traditional IRAs. But if you do get a Roth IRA distribution, uh, we follow the 1099R. If it's going to be taxable, uh, the coding will be correct, and we'll just go ahead and report it as it's, uh, as it's shown. If there are any calculations we need to do with a Roth account, that has to go in the form 8606. So if you have to go through any uh, iterations with the Roth, we do have to attach some additional forms. So the 8606 would be that document. Now, um, bless you. Um, so if we go through that process, if there's nothing reportable in, ta in, in box 2A, if there's nothing for the taxable amount, we're going to have that presumption is going to be fully taxable. That Perhaps the third party administrator just doesn't have the information. They're checking the box in, in 2B to say, we don't know how much of that amount is taxable. We don't know if they have any uh, after-tax contributions uh, to that plan. But what we're gonna do is we will presume that it's gonna be taxable, but we should still ask the question of the taxpayer. And the question we're gonna ask, did you make any after-tax contributions to your retirement account? And you're usually faced with a blank stare for about seven seconds as you're trying to process what you are asking. You may need to ask it again and then clarify what you mean. Because they don't exactly know what you mean by an after-tax contribution to your retirement account. Because not a whole lot of people end up doing that, particularly if it's a 401k. Most people aren't putting their own dollars into that 401k. Uh, typically, it would be a situation where we'd have someone who's established an individual retirement account. And they get to the year and they realize that perhaps not all their contributions would have been deductible. And they said, well, that's fine. Let's just go ahead and keep those monies in there and call it a non-deductible contribution to my IRA. So it's an after-tax dollar contribution. As we mentioned in the beginning, your own dollars come back to you tax-free. So now we have to go through a calculation of how much of that is going to be taxable and how much is recovery of basis. The good news, we don't have to do that calculation with Invita. The bad news, someone else has to do that, and usually it's outside accounts, and we're not really fun uh, with that process either. It's a long, convoluted process of understanding basis and getting a lot more documents from your client. So if they do come back and say, absolutely, I made after-tax contributions to my retirement account, uh, at that point, you're going to thank them, bundle up their paperwork, and hand it back to them, and uh, kind of give them some recommendations on where they're going to need to go. Uh, because unfortunately, that's without, uh, that's not within scope within VITA. So we're going to have to send those accounts elsewhere. 
Uh, generally, they'll probably need to talk to their third party administrator. Hopefully they can gather the basis information if they have it. Um, a lot of situations we see are people have done this many, many years ago and they've rolled their account from one to another. They've changed broker. Their broker may have changed investment firms and they didn't pull all the information together. So it is a little bit more of a convoluted process. Now there's another option as well. If they say, sure, I put $100 into my IRA account 20 years ago as a non-deductible contribution, then you can give them the option. Option A, you can go ahead and take your return to an outside accountant who will go ahead and calculate the information for you and charge you a lot more than what VITA does, which is nothing. Or option B, you can choose to have the entire amount taxable in full to the IRS. The IRS will not mind if you choose option B. So if there's not a whole lot there, they're not aware of what happened, we can always go ahead and say, we'll just go ahead and treat it all as taxable. Just the main part I want to bring out is that we can't uh, have any amount there going through a non-taxable uh, portion of an IRA. So if we run into that situation, we can't fix that, that problem in, within VITA. So if they have any non and after-tax contributions, that's going to have to go to an outside party. Uh, traditionally, a Roth distribution is going to be tax-free as long as certain conditions are met, uh, that, it's made, that the distributions within uh, after five years after the first contribution is made. Uh, basically, they uh, have reached age 59 and a half, which is kind of our magic number within retirement accounts, uh, or it's due to disability, uh, could be due to an estate beneficiary they've inherited, uh, or they're paying some first-time homebuyer costs. There are a couple exceptions, and that's where we take a look at that 1099-R and see do we have a, a code in there to indicate that they have met those requirements, that there's no additional uh, penalty on those. Um, so if the tests are not met, then we have a little bit of an issue. So the dis distribution could be partly taxable. And again, similar to what we had with non-deductible portion of an IRA, that's a very complex calculation and without, uh, we can't really do that with Invita, it's outside our scope. Uh, fortunately, we don't see a whole lot of Roth accounts that run in these cir circumstances where they have a partially taxable, uh, but if we do, unfortunately, we can't handle that uh, situation within, within VITA. And that one's a bit more unique because a Roth account set up differently. With a Roth account, you do not get a tax deduction for your money going in. Uh, instead, all the monies you pull out would be tax-free. So a kind of more popular option for uh, people who now get into the workforce and say, I'm going to wait 40 years before I retire. I don't need the deduction today. I'll wait and go ahead and let that money grow and then take it out all tax-free, assuming the tax laws don't change 40 years from now. But the issue is, is most of that money is going to be their own money coming back to them. So again, it's going to be that calculation of how much is actually taxable and how much is not. So unlike the first case where we can say, how would you just like the government to tax it all and we don't have to pay the fee? Uh, in this case, probably a good amount, maybe their own dollars coming back. So we cannot go ahead and just treat it all as taxable. It's going to be partly their own money coming back. Okay. So that's kind of taking a look at the IRA SEP and simple. That's where we're going to see that box checked on the 1099R indicating it's an IRA SEP or simple. So in most cases, what we're going to uh, take a look at is box one is going to be fully taxable unless the administrator already knows that they have a tax-free uh, part. And they're going to indicate that in box 2A, and we can just run with those numbers. When we get to the uh, pensions and annuities piece, that's going to be any type of pension annuity coming from a 401k, a 403b if someone had worked for a nonprofit. Uh, or governmental plans, uh, 457Bs would be the uh, plan established by a government organization. So these are going to be uh, essentially our more <clears throat> traditional retirement type plans. These again are going to be fully taxable to the recipient uh, as long as no after-tax contributions were made to their plans. Uh, we are seeing some hybrid type plans, some Roth 401ks now. Um, hopefully we're not going to see anyone take distributions from those since they're relatively new plans, but those would be examples of uh, some after-tax contributions. Or if someone said, I'd like to put more money into my account on an after-tax basis. Those we typically see a little bit more in a governmental annuity plan, and we'll actually run through an example here of how we can do that with a simplified method to show how do you recover basis in those accounts. What we're going to do with these pensions and annuities, again, we're going to follow the same rules. If the 1099-R has an amount shown in box one and box 2A, we simply enter those numbers and we move right along. Uh, with pensions and annuities, we may have a slightly different issue. There may be some calculations we need to go through, particularly if we're going to see something in boxes five or nine. There may be some indication we have something there, uh, particularly when you see uh, box 2A being blank and box 2B saying we can't determine how much of this is taxable. Uh, we don't see that very often, uh, but we do want to talk about how you can use that simplified method. That is within scope, and actually TaxLayer does a very nice job of that as well. 
Uh, one other area that we may see, uh, it, it's actually not as well known as what I thought it would be, uh, would be a uh, exception for insurance premiums for retired uh, service officers. So if you're a retired public safety officer, uh, someone who's been in uh, the police force, fire department, uh, ambulance service, you can actually exclude up to $3,000 per year from your taxable pensions and annuities, as long as those are going to pay for medical premiums. So you can actually take the higher of, I'm sorry, it would be up to um, the, the lower of your actual premiums paid or $3,000, so whichever amount is less. Most cases, the $3,000 is gonna be less than the supplemental insurance that they need to pay. Uh, but we do have the option within TaxSlayer to go ahead and indicate that. Uh, so if someone does come in, and they indicate that they are a retired public safety officer and they're uh, paying for out-of-pocket medical, which uh, oftentimes happens, we can uh, take advantage of that uh, retired uh, public safety officer and take that up to $3,000 deduction off the return. Uh, again, uh, we may see some partly taxable annuities. Uh, in most cases, hopefully, uh, that the third-party administrator knows how much that is, uh, particularly with our non-retirement annuities. So these are going to be things that people buy that they're not coming out of an employment context. You can go to an insurance company or a financial broker and say, I'd like to purchase an annuity. You'll take your cash and go ahead and put that all up front and you'll decide whether you want money to be coming out over a single lifetime, a period of years, joint lifetime. There's a lot of options out there. So hopefully the person who sold you the annuity is also monitoring the annuity and telling you how much of that in the calculation is your own dollars coming back and they, will, they should have that amount listed in box 2A. Um, so there may be a taxable amount, there may be a non-taxable amount that we'd, that we'd see there. Uh, if we need to calculate it ourselves, then we'll go through and we'll show you how to do the simplified method, uh, which will be coming up in just a little bit. Okay, the weird stuff. Those are all kind of the normal things. So those are all the codes that we've talked about that are uh, traditionally within scope. Now there are a couple others that are also within scope that are a little bit different. So we just talked about some letters and some numbers, and then all of a sudden now we're gonna be talking about letters and numbers together. Uh, you may have seen a 7D. You're like, okay, well, what is it? Is it a D, is it a seven? How do I put it in? Well, the main indication that that uh, uh, is basically looking at here is a indication that they are earnings from a non-retirement annuity. So these are the commercial annuities that someone may purchase. And the difference that we have, for federal purposes, they're still gonna be treated exactly the same. The 7D is gonna indicate it's a normal distribution. The D is gonna give a classification that is coming from a uh, commercial non-retirement annuity. So it's still gonna be taxable for federal the same way we just talked about it. The main difference we're gonna find is that 7D is gonna indicate now it can be taxable for PA. So because it's considered a investment account, not a retirement account, those earnings are treated as interest on the PA return. So we can go ahead and enter that in a tax layer and the 7D is gonna indicate whatever is taxable for federal purposes is now also taxable for PA purposes. And oftentimes when you see these, you'll talk to the client and you'll say, oh, I see that you have a non-retirement annuity. Um, we have to take a look and see, do we owe any PA tax if you're not gonna be subject to tax forgiveness? They say, I've never paid tax on that before. It's probably true. A lot of people don't bother with the 7D, uh, but it is taxable. PA uh, uh, does treat that as interest income. Uh, so it is something we need to go ahead and report uh, for PA purposes. And we'll go through an example here uh, in, our, in our handout and show you what that 7D will look like. And we'll also talk about some questions that may arise when a client asks about what happens with that 7D. Uh, likewise, I don't think we see it all that often here with Invita, but if someone has a charitable gift annuity, uh, sometimes you may see people enter into these as they enter into a uh, uh, retirement community, especially a nonprofit. Uh, if they have some excess funds, they may put in a charitable gift annuity. That would be indicated with a code F. So again, it's gonna be taxable for federal purposes. The code F, again, means it's gonna be considered interest income. It's not a retirement plan, it's actually a uh, investment account. So a charitable gift annuity is gonna be considered interest income for Pennsylvania law. So just PA purposes only, not for local. Uh, the 7D and the code F would be taxable for PA. Uh, the one thing we'll take a look at for box four, that's gonna be uh, on account of a uh, beneficiary. Now we talked about for PA purposes, if you take money out of your account early, a code one will indicate that that can possibly be subject to Pennsylvania and local tax. It does not apply if you are a beneficiary. 
So you may take money out under 59 and a half and that will not be subject to Pennsylvania or local tax. So it's not in the same classification as a code one early distribution. So fortunately, PA won't tax that one. So we do wanna mention the ones they will pick up, uh, the 7D and the four, uh, which will be picked up. Most of the other ones are not gonna be taxable and tax layer will know not to carry those over. So the ones we have to watch out for are code one, code 7D, and code F are the main ones that we have to watch for Pennsylvania purposes. Okay, so getting into a couple of the other areas. So most of these are gonna be relatively straightforward. And uh, depending on what site you're at, uh, you may see a lot of 1099s. Uh, and hopefully the 1099Rs are coming with the code seven, pretty much easy to work with. You see them, you put them in, and we're ready to go. Where we may run into a little bit of a uh, issue is where we have what we consider that partly taxable annuity and pension. This is where we're gonna be start seeing those information uh, reports on the lines five and the lines nine of the 1099R, indicating that there is some investment in the contract by the taxpayer. So what we wanna take a look at is if they've made any investment, any of those after-tax dollars, or if they purchased the annuity, that we want to be sure that we're uh, recording only the amount of earnings, not their original investment back. And it's a calculation that the annuity companies typically go through. So they're usually pretty good about that whole process. They'll go through and indicate on 2A how much of that is taxable. Where I've seen this a lot more in practice is with governmental uh, pension plans, that the government may not know exactly how to qualify it. And we have an example of that in your packet as well, and we can walk through the process of how we're gonna do the calculation. So in the first year of someone taking a, an annuity, which is partly taxable, we'll take the amount that's sitting in box 9B. That's gonna show their total investment in the contract. And we'll walk through our simplified method. Now the simplified method is something that Tax uh, Slayer allows us to do. It's a simple form that we can go into and we need uh, some certain pieces of information. We'll kind of walk through some examples here. So as long as the annuity starting after uh, July 1st, 1986, um, and we've been using the simplified method before, we're gonna continue to use the simplified method. So if they, probably not gonna see many people that had any issues that their annuity started well before 86 that are still coming into VITA, uh, based on kind of how the annuities are typically paid out. But if they've been using the simplified method, we're gonna continue to use that method. Hopefully they either had come to us before or they brought a copy of their 1040 from the prior year so we can understand that calculation. Now we can also calculate the simplified method on our own as well. So if the annuity started after 1996, uh, November 16th, 1996, so if they start on November 15th, they're in a whole different situation. November 16th or after, they're good. Um, and the following rules have to apply, that the payments are a qualified employment plan, uh, basically a qualified employee annuity or some sort of tax sheltered plan, uh, that's kind of the 403Bs, the 457s, those types of plans. Uh, and the annuity recipient is under the age of 75 or that the guaranteed payments are gonna be less than five. So they're gonna meet a couple qualifications. So this is kind of our traditional retiree coming out of a uh, government or 403B type plan. Now, if for some reason that they meet only one of those conditions, we can't, and, but not both, we can't use the simplified method. We actually have to go with what's called the general rule. Uh, that's a lot more complex. There's an entire publication in the IRS uh, uh, library that talks about the general rule. That's Pub 939. So if you see that and you get to that issue, it might be a good time to kind of hit the pause button on the return and uh, go through the calculation. That's going to take a little bit more time to get through. So if you're thinking you might get to your next appointment in the next 15 minutes, that won't be happening. Um, so that one we may want to take a look at and uh, spend a little bit more time going through the calculation. But we can do the simplified rule, and that's actually a fairly uh, uh, routine process to go through. So what do we need in order to calculate the simplified method? Well, hopefully they brought their prior 1040 uh, if they weren't uh, coming to VITA before. The 1040 for prior years will generally show how much of that pension will be excluded. Because if you started it once, you're going to keep using that same amount until you've recovered all of your basis. The other thing that we would probably need would be to uh, the details of the annuity payments themselves. How much are they receiving? Uh, whether it's a single life or a joint annuity. And then we need to know the birth dates of the individuals who are gonna be receiving that annuity. So we need to know the age of the recipient when the annuity payments started. And if it's based on joint lives, we're gonna have to know the age of both at the time. So if it's a joint annuity, uh, we need to know the uh, joint ages of both parties in order to do the calculation. 
Uh, and then we just need to know the net investment in the annuity. And if you ask a client, how much is your net investment in the annuity, they will not know. The good news is box 9B will tell you exactly how much it is. 9B is going to show you their net after-tax investment in the annuity. So that's the amount that we're going to be recovering over time with the simplified method. And we'll go through a calculation. Perhaps it might be a good opportunity right after break to do that, uh, to go through the calculation. But we're going to be using a couple different tables. If we use a single life annuity, we're going to use table one. If you're using a two-person annuity, table two. So hopefully it'll be pretty standard. One life, table one. Two lives, table two. So the government didn't mess that one up, so they actually went in logical order. All right, so one of the things we're going to take a look at is going through that fixed period of payments. We're going to understand how uh, the annuity process is going to be paid out, and we're going to be applying that cost over time. And we're going to use a simplified method. Fortunately, uh, uh, tax lawyer is going to do the calculations for us and automatically drop in the piece that's going to be recovering a basis. So that will allow us to go through and uh, do the calculation, and it works out very nicely. All right. Should we do this now, Steve, or should we take a quick break? All right, we're pressing on. Excellent, good. Good to see an enthusiastic crowd here. That's always good to see. All right. Uh, so we're going to run through a quick example, and in your packet of information, you actually have a uh, simplified worksheet that we can kind of uh, walk through of how that's going to look. So uh, worksheet A is going to be the simplified method, and that's going to be how we would do the calculation. Fortunately, we don't need to do it by hand, but what you're going to see is the same information that you would find within your uh, tax slayer program. So if you run into a situation, and maybe one of the things I'll do for you as well, if you're in your packet already, uh, and you'll see that there is a 1099R at the very top, it'll say statement of annuity paid. One of your first indications, it's an annuity. So they actually stated on there, this is coming from the Office of Personnel Management, um, which if you see these, you'll realize it's coming from the federal government as a retiree. Uh, what you'll see in this case, and I apologize for the, uh, for the printing being poor, uh, also the function of the government using the cheapest printer possible to go ahead and send these things out. Uh, but you will take a look at these and see we have a gross distribution in box one, uh, 53,388, not a bad pension. And we'll also see that there's an amount in 9B, which is total employee contribution. So if you're getting a 1099R and you're gonna uh, see that we may have the Simplify method to use, these will be kind of our clues. We don't have anything in the taxable amount. In fact, they clearly put unknown in there. So it means that we probably have to do some calculations. The fact that there is an amount sitting there in 9B would indicate that we need to go through and uh, make some modifications. So this is where the simplified method would come in. If this is the first year that they've been doing it, we'll go into the simplified method calculation. If they've come in from uh, doing the simplified method before, we have to go in and, and use the information from the prior return to get our schedule to work. But I'll run through a quick example just to kind of show you how this would uh, play out. So if we have uh, Bill Smith, age 65, started receiving retirement benefits, uh, call this 2018 under a joint and survivor annuity. Uh, so his annuity starting date is January 1st. Uh, benefits are paid for the joint lives of Bill and his wife, Kathy, who's the same age, which makes the math a whole lot easier to work with here. So Bill had contributed $31,000 to a qualified plan and uh, did not receive any distributions before the annuity starting date, kind of a typical uh, annuity type plan that the payments are going to start once the uh, uh, program has uh, started. He's going to get $1,200 a month in a retirement benefit. And his wife is going to be receiving a $600 benefit for the rest of her life once Bill passes away. So one of the first questions we take a look at is, would the simplified method be appropriate in this context? Yes, perfect. Because if it weren't, then we wouldn't have to go through the example. But it would be. This is exactly what we're looking at for the simplified method because we have an annuity. It's going to be payment over a period of time. It's actually a joint life annuity. We have an investment in contracts. So we know $31,000 of these payments are actually Bill's money that's coming back to him. So he shouldn't be taxed on that a second time. The question is, how do we determine that? So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through our worksheet and just kind of show you how that process would, would play out. So what we would do is go through and determine uh, our annuity uh, plan itself. So if we take a look at the simplified method worksheet, 
what we're going to do is enter the total pension annuity payments received for the year. In this case, Bill would be receiving a 1099R. If he's getting $1,200 a month, which fortunately starts on January 1, he'll be getting 12 payments of $1,200, so $1,440. Uh, $14,400. Now, the second line is enter cost in the contract at the annuity starting date. Fortunately, if he's getting the 1099R, what we should be seeing is $14,400 in box one, 2A probably being an unknown or a zero amount with taxable amount not determined. The line in uh, 9B should be $31,000. So that would be our indication of how we would go through the process. Those are our first two lines coming directly off the 1099R. Now box three is actually where we need to do a little bit of calculation and you may have to grab your calculators to do this. But what we're gonna take a look at is taking a look at the combined ages. Now, because we know it's on a joint life, we're gonna be using table number two for two lives. What we do is we add up the ages of the uh, annuitants at the time that the annuity started. So we know Bill is um, 65 and his wife is 65 so if we do the math that'll be 65 plus 65 is 130. we'll take a look at table number two and go down to the chart where it says if the combined ages of the annuity starting date were 110 or under which would typically be both parties are 55 or maybe one party's 80 and the other one's 23. Um, however the case may be that would be our first number we take a look at uh, so if it's under that amount, we'd be using 410. And we keep going down through the, the checklist. Uh, we're sitting at 130, so we take a look at the third line there, which will say that we enter 310 on line number three. Now, the nice part is, is once we get to that part, all we have to do is enter the ages of the recipient. We don't actually have to do the calculation. Tax Slayer will do it for us. So we just get the amounts in the 1099R. We put the age of the annuitants in. It's going to start going through the calculation. Um, so we just want to show you mechanically how it works, not to show you exactly how a uh, engine works for you to have to drive a car, but we're going to give you a little insight in how that's going to work. So what would happen is we take our investment in the contract at $31,000. The system's going to go ahead and divide it by that 310, which comes out to $100. Uh, what we're going to do is multiply that by the amount of annuities uh, payments we receive, because since it's a full year, it's 12 times 100. So we have a $1,200 exclusion. For this year. Uh, where we want to see, and this would be if we have someone coming in who's been using the simplified method before, we can have uh, the opportunity to enter all the cost recovery they've done in this line six. So if they've always been coming to Vita, uh, well, I take that back because Tax Slayer only started a couple years ago. So uh, if they've only been coming to Vita and they've only started the simplified method in the last year or two, we're in great shape. If uh, they have been doing this for a while, we may need to go ahead and enter that, that information. How much cost recovery have they had already? It's just basically a way that the system knows not to take too much. Because it's, because it's based on a life annuity, it's gonna keep taking the same amount year after year. Uh, once the system knows that uh, it's recovered all the cost, it will stop taking that reduction. Now, this would take a very, relatively long period of time. We're talking about $100 per month for 310 months. So. Uh, if you're volunteering for that many years here at Vita, you're going to get a, give them some sort of special award for volunteering to come back and, and see the client all the way through their 310 months of annuity distributions. Um, at that point in time, all the cost has been recovered. So then the full amount of the annuity would be taxable. So if uh, Bill or his wife survives beyond the 30, uh, 310 months, then uh, the full amount will be taxable to them. They've already recovered all their bases. So what we're going to take a look at here is we haven't recovered any, so there's still $31,000 available of his original investment to uh, recoup before it's being taxed. So what we're going to do is instead of just saying the first $31,000 is not taxable, the government says, well, we need to tax a portion of that. So the way we tax a portion of it is you get to take $100 off per month for the next 310 months. So year one, we're going to take $1,200 and treat that as recovery of cost. So in this case, what's going to happen, we're going to see $1,440 or $14,400 coming off on the 1099R. But what we're going to see as taxable annuity is only going to be the $13,200. The system's going to go ahead and calculate that $1,200 is recovery of cost. 
And then what we basically do, the schedule will be completed where we're going to take that $1,200, subtract it from the $31,000, and know going forward for all future years that he has $29,800 of cost yet to recover. So those are kind of the important pieces we'll take a look at. If for some reason that they have been using the simplified method and they don't have their prior year return, we can still work with that information. Uh, we basically, all we have to know at that point is when did their annuity start? We can kind of back into that, uh, to that piece if need be. So if you do run into that situation, uh, feel free to talk to your site coordinator or eventually run up the chain to Steve, which may eventually run up the chain back to me. So uh, we'll go through the process of how that would work. But uh, it, it sounds relatively complex, but it truly is simplified. All we really need to do to do this method is to pull information off the 1099R. We know exactly how much they're getting in total annuity. We know how much their cost uh, of the annuity was. That's sitting in uh, box 9B. So what we do at that point is just enter that information. All we need to know is what ages were the annuitants when the process started, and the system will do the rest of the calculations for us. So it's fairly simple to go through that process. Okay, so that would be our simplified method. All right. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you have used a simplified method within TaxSlayer? Okay. Oh, pretty pretty good amount already. And any issues with the uh, tax slayer calculation? Is it as simple as I tried to describe it? Okay, good. Hearing no one disagreeing, that's a good sign. All right. Uh, so it does work out fairly nicely once you have that piece of information, uh, and that will work even if, if the first time annuity or if someone's coming into Vita for the first time, we can go through the simplified method as well. All right, so a couple other things that we want to take a look at just to remind you about that uh, early distribution from retirement plan. I kind of alluded to uh, this not being the most ideal situation for our clients coming in and taking money out, out of their retirement account early. A uh, couple reasons why. One, it means that they've taken funds out of retirement, which is designed to be used for later in life. Second, if they needed the money to take it out currently, they probably don't have the money sitting around just waiting to find out how much of that they owe to pay taxes. Uh, when you talk to them, the money's gone. Uh, they didn't know that it was taxable at all because no one ever told them that. Um, it's usually the excuse that you'll get as to why they're uh, confused as to why they owe dollars now. Uh, but again, what we're going to see is that we're going to see that there is going to be a check mark in box 2B showing, showing a total distribution. Uh, typically, it's going to be also accompanied by uh, code 1 in box 7. And again, hopefully, we're going to see that there will be the uh, uh, federal income tax withheld in box 4 to go ahead and help offset those dollars. Uh, what we're going to take a look at is tax layer will automatically assume the 10% penalty applies. You don't need to do anything else other than enter the information and be prepared for your discussion at the end about why the tax return has changed or why they're no longer getting money back or any of those other features. But we don't have to do anything else. Just enter the 1099R as it exists. Uh, again, Pennsylvania and local will tax these now as compensation because they're under the age of retirement. PA treats this as if they are actually just getting compensated by their employer. Now, Pennsylvania will take the position that any amounts coming out of the retirement account would be taxable. However, Pennsylvania does have what we call the cost recovery rule, meaning that whatever dollars that you put into your own plan are not taxable. They're gonna work much like federal under the annuity plans that your dollars that you put in come back to you tax-free. The way the Pennsylvania system works is your first dollar you put in comes out first. So what we need to take a look at, and this is also a fun question to ask your client when they're sitting there wondering why it's taxable. Well, how much did you put into your retirement account out of this early distribution? And they usually don't know. Uh, one of the benefits we have, if this is a relatively new job that they had, basically the last year or two, the government's gonna help us. We can take a look at their W-2s, whatever's sitting there as a employee contribution in box D. Um, on, on 12 is going to show us how much they put in. So that'll help us. That'll give, give us an indication because I can pretty much guarantee if someone's worked at a company for 15 years and you ask them, how much did you contribute? They, they don't know it to the penny. Their third party administrator may not know exactly how much they have. Uh, if they do have the opportunity, sometimes they can bring in their statement and they'll show employee contribution, employer contribution, how much they vested. If they have that, we can work with that information. But this is one of those areas where Sometimes we have to do a little bit more digging, and sometimes you can keep digging and you're never gonna hit the bottom of that hole. Um, we don't know exactly how much that is. So uh, kind of from a VITA perspective, I think what we do is, is kind of look at the issue and decide what would be an appropriate amount. 
uh, knowing that there is some cost recovery. Uh, again, both of these are going to be taxable for uh, PA and local purposes, so it's not the full distribution. We apply the cost recovery first. So if someone came in with a 1099-R showing $8,000 of distribution, early, with, uh, early distribution, no penalty uh, exception applies, for PA purposes, they would look for $8,000 being reported. But if the employee had $6,000 of their own contribution, only $2,000 would be taxable. If the employee somehow had $9,000 of contribution, fortunately, none of it's taxable. The downside is somehow they lost money in their retirement account over the past couple of years, which is probably not a good sign. Um, but what we do is we want to recover that first. Sometimes people may take a portion out of their retirement account and roll the rest over. So we always get to recover their initial investment first. So whatever they put into the plan comes out, and then anything beyond that will be what's going to be subject to taxation. So again, that number can be a little tricky to come up with, uh, so it may involve some additional discussion with the client. Okay, so what happens when they do have an early withdrawal? We do have a couple exceptions to that early withdrawal penalty. Uh, a couple common ones uh, that may happen, uh, if the third party administrator knows that they converted it, they'll have a, a code two um, in the 1099-R. But if the taxpayer had done something and the third party administrator doesn't know what they've done, they're gonna keep it as a code one in box seven. But we can go through and, and modify that. Uh, it's going to be the form 5329, which we do have uh, availability to complete that within uh, TaxSlayer. What may happen is someone may take a distribution out of their retirement account and tell their uh, advisor, I'll go ahead and, and deal with this on my own. You have the opportunity to roll those funds into your own IRA within a set period of time. And it's a set period of time. There's no exceptions to the set period. Uh, so you have 60 days to take those funds and put them into the new account. If you do that, you've effectively rolled those amounts over. So not only are you going to be avoiding the 10% penalty, but it's also not going to be taxable to you as well. But the problem is the 1099-R doesn't know that. We have to go in and basically correct that within the system. Um, so that's what we basically see, the full or partial indirect rollover to a qualified plan. As long as you do that within 60 days, it's going to be treated as a rollover. So in tax layer, you can actually treat it as a rollover for either all or part. It's going to take off that amount from taxable income. It's also not going to subject that to the 10% penalty. Uh, there are a couple other things. If they took money out of their retirement account to pay the IRS, which is not a good situation, but the IRS can attach to retirement accounts. That is not subject to a 10% penalty. So the government will look to get paid, but they won't charge you an additional 10% for taking money out of your account to pay them. Uh, on the form 5329, we can enter a code 2. Uh, death of the uh, participant uh, IRA owner, uh, typically, again, that's going to be uh, on account of uh, inheritance, so that won't be taxable either. There are going to be a couple other things that we're going to see. Um, if there's a total uh, disability, the third-party administrator might not know that. That is a uh, permissible code. We can use the 5329 to go ahead and indicate that. There are a couple other things that will also apply for the exception there as well. Uh, used for educational purposes, used for first-time home purchase. Now, not all of it will apply. There are some that apply only to 401ks, some that apply only to IRAs. So before we go through the process and start asking them, do you qualify for any of these following exceptions? What uh, A better question may be to say, what was the purpose of you taking the money out of your retirement account early? And allow them to tell you, oh, by the way, I took this out because I purchased a home for the first time, or uh, I had a child or grandchild who was getting off to school. So then we can say, well, let me see if we can qualify for an exception. Or I needed the funds to go ahead and pay uh, health insurance because I was out of work or something along those lines. Those are all going to be our valid codes for getting out of the 10% penalty. Again, it doesn't make the distribution tax free. It's simply just taking that 10% penalty off the table. So we can use the form 5329. Uh, just in practice, I've found don't volunteer what the excuses are first to get out of it. Kind of ask them why the monies had come out of the account uh, rather than for them to take a look at the list and say, that looks good. We'll go ahead and use that one. All right. Yes. Correct. Correct. Right. So the question is, is, is the form 1099-R is going to show up with a code one in box seven? The form 5329 is basically a statement to the IRS saying, we're going to modify that, that treatment. So TaxSlayer, if you don't do anything else with it, will treat that distribution as an early withdrawal 
going to subject to tax and the 10% penalty automatically. You don't have to do anything else. The only time you need the 5329 is if there is a known exception to that, uh, to that penalty that the taxpayer is going to qualify for. So if they qualify for one of those exceptions, that's the time we'd fill out the 5329 to exclude either all or part of that amount from the 10% penalty. So once you do that, then the IRS knows that it's going to override essentially the, the preferred treatment of the 1099R. So the form 5329 is going to basically allow that to, to occur. So should stave off any additional questions, presuming the reasons valid that the 5329 is actually filed. Okay, so the question here is a direct contribution, uh, which is still permissible under the tax code. You can contribute up to $100,000 per year from your retirement account directly to a charity. Oftentimes, the 1099-R should not be issued in that case. Uh, in, in that case, it's a direct distribution directly to the charity, so it should not be reported at all on the 1040 itself. Likewise, you cannot do then double dip and take the charitable contribution. But most administrators should know not to go ahead and report the 1099-R uh, uh, for distribution directly to charity. Uh, if there is, there is a, a code I believe we can use in tax layer, which I'll be able to touch on right after the break. Okay. Um, I think we just have a few more slides here that we may get through and then we'll take a quick break and then go right to uh, some additional questions. So if, uh, bless you, so if you do have anything that would be applicable for that penalty exception, you can pull up the 5329. Again, don't show the client what the options are yet. Ask them why they took it out. But you can use the drop down box and go ahead and select your reason and put in the amount that would be qualifying for that exception. Uh, so a couple of the codes that we'd see there uh, to either reduce or eliminate the penalties, some of the common ones would be uh, code um, 05, that's basically if they're using any unreimbursed medical expenses um, that exceeded 7.5% uh, of AGI. So as long as those amounts would have been deductible on the Schedule A, you can actually use your retirement dollars in an early situation to go ahead, still taxable to you, but the 10% penalty doesn't apply. So this may be situations where someone may have a catastrophic medical situation and you can actually take funds out of your medical, uh, out of your retirement account to pay those medical funds. If so, then the 10% penalty will not apply. Uh, if, if you have a, a qualified domestic relation order, again, that's under a divorce decree where you're moving funds from one to another. If for some reason your third party administrator has shown that to be a taxable distribution to you, uh, you can put a code 06 in the 5329 to say it's part of the qualified domestic relation order. It is not subject to the additional 10% penalty. Um, just note, this one does not apply to IRAs. It's only for 401ks. So if someone comes in and says, hey, I did this out of my IRA account under a divorce, unfortunately, the 10% penalty is still going to apply. It applies only to 401ks and 403bs, 457bs. The way we can tell when we take a look at the 1099R, if that IRA separate simple box is checked, this code won't apply. So if you try and put it in and tax lawyer won't allow you to take it, it probably knows you're trying to do it on a, an account that's not eligible. Uh, a couple other things we'll see is if you have to take out health insurance for an unemployed individual, that would be a code 07. Again, taxable for federal, but the 10% penalty would not apply. Uh, code 8 is where we may see people who are doing that for qualified higher education expenses. Uh, again, that's going to be um, a little bit broader. It's actually going to be our tuition, our fees, our reasonable room and board. Um, let the IRS define what reasonable room and board is. Uh, you know, if you're on campus, even though the uh, you take a look and the tuition prices seem high enough, and then you get the room and board and you think they're living better than we are. Um, that's reasonable in the IRS's view. Uh, getting a, a multi-floor uh, brownstone if you're going to NYU and paying uh, $20,000 a month for rent is probably not reasonable accommodations for a college student. Uh, eating at Chick-fil-A every day is probably not reasonable accommodations for room and board. But uh, if it's reasonable, if it's through the college, those would qualify. So no um, cap on those. Uh, you do need to reduce that amount for anything you're getting from tax-free scholarships. So you can't double dip there as well. Uh, if you're getting any grants or employee assistance, those need to be reduced as well. Uh, code 09 would apply for first-time home buyers. Now, where we had the, the QDRO exception, did not apply to IRAs. The first time home buyer only applies to IRAs. So it doesn't apply if you're taking money out of your 401k, 403b, or 457 plan to buy a home. It's only out of IRAs 
and it's only up to $10,000 for first-time home buyers. And as you can probably tell from your years of experience, when the IRS says something, they don't really mean it. So first-time home buyer doesn't mean it's your first home you've ever purchased. It just means you haven't bought one in a while, which they should probably change the classification to be, I haven't bought a home in a while, can I take money out of my account? Yes, you can, but that's very verbose. So they just call it first-time home buyer, which means not really your first time buying a home. Um, so there are a couple definitions we take a look at there. Again, it's going to be for IRA only, so it doesn't work if it's coming out of a 401k. All right, uh, just a few more things I wanted to get to quick, and we'll take a break and do some questions. Uh, we've seen a couple of these pop up recently, uh, which have caused a little bit of uh, concern with, uh, mainly on the PA side. Uh, these would be coming out of insurance contracts. These are going to be where people have purchased a non-retirement annuity, and they're going to be getting uh, code distribution six. Um, this can be an exchange of life insurance. This can be where someone has decided that they want to exchange uh, a life insurance policy or long-term care contract. These are typically going to be tax-free. Under Code Section 1035, an exchange of an insurance contract is not taxable for federal purposes. The problem is not federal. It's for PA. Pennsylvania takes the approach that, that those monies are going to be considered um, an exchange for insurance. They're not going to be taxable for PA purposes, but they will impact your uh, SP. They will impact your uh, rent rebate. Uh, so Pennsylvania treats those as income for purposes of the uh, SP and the, the PA rent rebate. Uh, kind of like the other things that we see that they're going to add back in, and I don't want to steal thunder from those of you who had been here for the rent rebate claim, but any non-taxable items, inheritances, things like that are added back to those same schedules. So PA will treat anything with the distribution code six. And unfortunately what happens is we usually get this a couple months after the return's been filed. Someone thinks that they're entitled to the rent rebate and they get a denial of claim because Pennsylvania will treat it as income for purposes of the qualification. Uh, we also take a look at uh, code W uh, these would be when people are actually using uh, funds to purchase long-term care contracts. So uh, traditionally, they're they coming out of, um, uh, if you have an insurance plan and you're using your cash value to go ahead and buy long-term care uh, insurance, that will show up as a 1099R with a code W. Uh, the W is going to be tax-free, though. So that's going to be tax-free for both federal, state, and local purposes. So just a couple codes that have popped up recently, just to make you aware of it. Uh, these are the kind of ones we say 98% of the stuff we cover in the first couple slides, and this last 2% is what we want to be sure you don't have any issues with going into the season. Okay, uh, so just want to leave you with a couple additional resources. So in addition to our material here, uh, as, as always, the IRS has some fairly full instructions on the 1099-R. Uh, if you don't know where they are, typically turn one of the sheets over, and the instructions are right on the back of it, which makes it pretty convenient. Uh, the form uh, 5498, the instructions for that as well. We'll be going through uh, the process of what's going to be taxable. A couple publications. Uh, publication 590A is basically the uh, contributions to the IRAs. Uh, the uh, 590B is distribution. So if you take a look at a 1090, um, 1099R with an IRA box checked and you're not quite sure how to handle it, a number of those situations will probably be addressed in the 590B. Hopefully nothing we haven't discussed here tonight. So if they're really, really unique, let us know. We'll help, we'll help you take a look at it. Uh, a couple other things, if you're just curious, the Pub 575 talks about pensions and annuities. Uh, again, the 939 is to go through the general rule. If we have to go ahead and calculate how much is taxable and not taxable and the simplified rule doesn't matter, you're going to have to spend a little bit of time. Go make yourself a cup of coffee, read through the 939. We'll have to go through the general rule. Uh, and then the instructions for the 5329 will give you a little bit more information about those codes we had talked about for penalty exception. So hopefully that'll get you through the majority of the 1099s that you're going to be seeing through VITA. And uh, we'll go ahead and take a quick break here. How much do we, uh, five minute break, and we'll be able to regroup back for uh, questions and answers. Thank you. <laughs> 